He threw a big party at his house. Only two people didn't show up, Mom and Dad. They couldn't come. They were locked in the bedroom. Dead. When the party's over. His mom took his phone away, and he said he was going to kill her. And he did. They threw a blowout party with his parents still in the house. My eyes popped up. This is real. Now his friend takes you inside the crime. He showed me blood splatter on the baseboard. Oh. I told him that I was getting the hell out of there. A tug of war over who's in charge. And his parents plan to stop him until he stopped them first. Killer party. Plus, I don't care if you're in the Wild West. I don't care if you're in the hood. There was no honor in shooting somebody in the back. A parent's nightmare. A good son experimenting with drinking and then sneaking home and climbing through the window of the wrong house. Inside, a terrified neighbor with a gun. A look inside the investigation and a heartbroken father retracing his son's last steps. I was absolutely outraged. When the party's over. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. The teenage years can be rough. Parents setting limits, kids pushing back, challenging authority. It often becomes a tug of war over who's in charge. But as you're about to see, when the stakes are raised and teenage defiance is mixed with a toxic cocktail of drugs and alcohol, the consequences can be deadly. First, a battle of wills that turn to rage. And as Ryan Smith first reported in 2014, two murders that would shock a sleepy community. Nestled on Florida's Treasure Coast, 40 miles north of West Palm Beach, sits Port St. Lucie, a city once designed for retirees, now teeming with working families. It's a maze of streets that all kind of wind together. There's the sense on these empty streets that something's amiss. Even the street signs aren't quite right. They didn't have time to spell all the street names correctly. Growing up here is a modest sort of happiness for any kid. But as novelist Nathaniel Rich learned, that gets old. Every teenager complained about how boring it was in Port St. Lucie. The only thing to do is drink and get high, have parties. And it's a party that happened here that no one will ever forget. Now you're looking live at the Port St. Lucie home where police say a 17-year-old boy killed his parents, a drug-addicted teenager who just wanted to party. He threw a big party at his house. Only two people didn't show up, Mom and Dad. They couldn't come. They were locked in the bedroom. Dead. The million-dollar question is why. Tyler, they say you murdered your parents. A 17-year-old killing his parents, an event that left a confused community looking to its teenagers for answers about high school senior Tyler Hadley. His parents were getting tired of him going out late and getting drunk. They got more strict. His mom took his phone away. And he said he hated him. Something like teenagers say. It's definitely something that really upset him. Everybody has like sick jokes, so he just thought it was like a sick joke. But what turns a teenager's sick joke into a sickening reality? We go inside the investigation into what made a Boy Scout turn into a teenager who did the unthinkable. Mike Mandel has known Tyler since they were both eight years old. He lived just a block away. So you know his parents. Absolutely. What were they like? They seemed like great parents to me. You know, every time I come over, if his mom was making something to eat, she'd say, hey, Mike, you want some of this? You know, how's it going? How's your family going? And how did Tyler feel about his parents? He loved them. This is Blake and Mary Jo um, forever in our hearts. Blake and Mary Jo Hadley thought Sunny Port St. Lucie was the perfect place to raise their two boys. Mary Jo, she was a school teacher, mm -hmm. you know, a great school teacher. And she loved kids so much, she dedicated her life to her two, two boys she had. His family says Blake loved his job at a local power plant, but his passion was his sons, the baby, Tyler, and Ryan, six years older. What was Blake like with the boys? He had a ball with them. He loved them. And in the beginning, Tyler seemed to be a happy little boy, celebrating birthdays and holidays with his family. He was constantly hugging his mom. I mean, constantly. He was an affectionate kid. I just remember him always being a funny kid. He was always, he had a really quick sense of humor. Yeah. And um, you never know what would come out of his mouth. <laughs> yeah, in a good way? Oh, I mean, sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> it was a quality that drew Mike to Tyler. I was walking around trying to find a friend and stumbled upon Tyler and he slowly became a best friend. Over time, Tyler began opening up, sharing with Mike his secrets and his insecurities. He a lot of times bashed himself and 
He said he wasn't good enough. He just always thought someone was better than him. But what started as a kid's self-doubt turned into a teenager's anger. He started skipping school, hanging out with the wrong crowd, getting on drugs. You know, that's just things he was starting to do, was get in trouble. He was starting to steal. And they said, just hide your purse. So they thought it was one of those teenage things. There were some neighbors who thought he was trouble. He once lit the wood, the forest preserve near his house on fire. Um, and, you know, he siphoned gasoline from the nearest uh, gas station once. Tyler's parents started cracking down. How did they discipline him? They really did everything possible as far as um, taking away the cell phone, bits and pieces of freedom. Uh, that, that children really, uh, you know, cherish at that age. They didn't just abandon him and just let him run in the streets like he wanted to. They, they tried to rein him in. But Tyler pushed back, continuing to defy his parents. He didn't like following any rules. He liked going out, doing drugs. And then his parents caught on. And he was already comfortable living that way, and he didn't want anyone to change it. Nancy Grace has followed this case. They were beginning to discipline him more and more. And by that, I don't mean take him out to the woodshed and give him a spanking. They would take away privileges. Well, Hadley would have none of that. His frustration and anger mounted. By the time Tyler was 17, his parents were at their wits end. They put him into an outpatient substance abuse program, but nothing changed. He came home drunk one night and he crawled through his window when his parents woke up. And then they took away his phone and his car. He felt that she was over disciplining him and he said he wanted to kill her. Did it sound like he might actually do it? Absolutely not. And Tyler's parents were keeping a closer eye on him, taking him to a family reunion in Georgia just one week before life would change forever. We really enjoyed having him. He was very polite. I never saw Tyler lose his temper ever. That's what his self is on. Posing for family pictures one minute, but plotting with his friends back home the next. Well, he was texting his friends and telling them we're going to have a party when I get home. So he was planning it while he was up there. And three days later, this ominous Facebook post. Party at my crib tonight. Maybe. Tyler said he's going to have a party tonight. My parents are going to Orlando. A friend Facebooked him. What about your parents? Are they going to come home in the middle of the party? And Hadley writes back, they won't. Trust me. A party at Tyler's house seemed odd with his parents now tightening the reins, but it was something else he said that really got Mike's attention. He tells you something about what he did the night before. Yeah, he said he was contemplating murdering them that night while they were sleeping in their bed. He said he couldn't do it. He didn't have it in him. And what did you think when he told you that? I got a weird feeling in my stomach, but it's Tyler. There's no way he would do this. Then, a few hours later, a second Facebook post party at my house hit me up this time there was no maybe Tyler Hadley's house party was set he had been bragging about it for days he was going to have the party come hell or high water and nothing and nobody was gonna get in his way one of my friends had gone on Facebook and seen the post about the party everyone knew his parents were strict uh, and it really wasn't until the day of the party that people started to take him seriously there was so little to do in Port St. Lucie that night that any teenager who heard about the party was going to check it out. Around 9.30 p.m., Tyler picks up Mike and some other friends, and they head back to his house. Jesse DeRay is in the car. When we were pulling up to Tyler's house, he said something real crazy is going to come out in the next week. I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, you'll find out. Did you see any other family vehicles there? Yeah, and I thought that was kind of strange that his mom's car was there, too. I asked him where his parents were, told me they were in Georgia. It was a free-for-all. Kids could smoke inside the house. They were drinking. Kids were bringing beer and, and pot and pills. What's it like inside? Young people drinking and sitting around talking. But the weird thing was most people in there, Tyler didn't even know. I didn't know. They were strangers. You think he wanted to be known as having this huge party? Maybe. That's the only thing that makes sense. As the rowdy party rages on, a neighbor across the street makes a noise complaint. I woke up to, you know, squealing tires and kids hanging out of the car yelling. So I did call 911. Officers respond, but with no immediate cause for alarm, they leave the teens with a warning. 
When we come back, kids at the party are noticing there's something strange about this place, but only best friend Mike Mandel will discover how strange behind this door. My eyes popped up. This is real. He's claiming that he killed his parents. Stay with us. For months, 17-year-old Tyler Hadley's clashes with his parents had been escalating. So how is it possible they'd allow him to have a blowout party at their house on a Saturday night? As the party rages on, Tyler has a secret, and he's about to share the shocking details. Ryan Smith picks up the story. In Port St. Lucie, Florida, Tyler Hadley's house party is in full swing. 60 teenagers drinking and drugging with no parents in sight. Tyler's older brother, Ryan, away at college. One kid was walking around saying, I smell dead people. Other kids had seen some signs of blood or what could have been blood. The house was a mess. It looked like it had been ransacked. As the night wears down, Tyler is growing agitated. Do you recall him yelling at somebody trying to go back towards the back part of the house? Yes. I heard him just saying, get out of the hallway. I don't want anyone in the hallway. How does he seem? He seems eager to tell me something, and he wants to take me down the street and talk. All right, so you guys walk out the house. Tell me what happens now. He says, Mike, I killed my parents. And I said, no, you didn't, Tyler. Shut up. And he said, Mike, look at the driveway. All the cars are there. My parents are dead. I killed them. And then, with partying teens still inside the house, Tyler tells Mike to look for the telltale sign blood by a computer desk where Mary Jo had been working and by the master bedroom door. But still, Mike doesn't believe it. I actually thought he went that far out to play a prank on me that he actually put fake blood on the ground. Really? You think he's playing a prank at this point? Any anything but what it is. The idea that teenagers are playing beer pong right here while just steps away behind this door, his best friend's parents lay lifeless, is too much for Mike to fathom. I took Tyler into the garage and I said, I want to see them dead if you really did it. I don't believe you. Tyler says he'll prove it after everyone leaves, but Mike doesn't wait. I walk around back and I go check for myself. I come up to the door, a party's going on over here, and I turn the doorknob, push it, and it opened. I looked down and I seen his father's leg against the door. What was going through your mind when you saw his leg? My eyes popped up, and I said, he's telling the truth, he did it. This is real. I, I'm in shock. I feel like there's no way that I'm seeing this. Wake up. Then, Mike Mandel does something as shocking as the party. He doesn't leave. Now, you'd think Mandel would rush to call his parents or take his cell phone surreptitiously and call 911. No. Mandel continued to party hardy for several hours. Why do you stay? It's a hard feeling to explain. You know, I knew this guy for so long. If something wants you to stay here right now. You need to talk to Tyler and figure out as much stuff as you can. How long do you stay? A couple hours. How do you do that? How do you, isn't it eating you up inside? It is eating me up inside. Even though you know he just killed two people, you don't see him as a killer. You still see him as a friend at that point? Yes. Why not try to get Tyler out of the house immediately or call the cops? Because he could be a danger to everybody in that house, including you. I was still in shock. Then, in a bizarre moment between best friends, they take this selfie. And I have to show you something here. Why did you take this picture? Because I knew it was going to be the last time I ever seen him. So this was to remember him? Yeah. A lot of people look at this picture and they say, Mike's callous. He doesn't care. What do you say to those people? Look at the picture. Am I smiling? Is Tyler smiling? He looks very worried to me. And he looks very scared. And how do you look in this picture? Well, I look like that this is the worst day of my life. I knew I was going to call the cops on when I took that picture. In shock and unable to keep it to himself, Mike tells another friend. And he showed me blood splatter on the baseboard. Oh, baseboard? Near his parents' bedroom. What did you do? I basically told him that I was getting the hell out of there. I was like, I'm leaving. You can come with me. Mike is still reluctant to leave his best friend, but when he finally does, Tyler is quick to notice. Tyler calls me on my cell phone, and he said, 
Mike, where'd you go? You know, the party's still happening. And I said, Tyler, I'm, I'm tired. It's four in the morning. I'm going to sleep. And he said, okay, man, well, I'm having a party tomorrow. Are you going to come? And I said, yeah, I'll be there. This is a party Tyler never wants to end. And at 4.40 a.m., he posts on Facebook, party at my house again. Hit me up. But yeah, Mike Mandel up. won't be there. And immediately after I hang up the phone, I call Crime Stoppers. He got a call from our call center, and he's claiming he just, uh, he killed his parents. I'm um, sorry, he did what to his parents? He's claiming that he killed his parents. What were you thinking as you're making that call? You know that what you're telling Crime Stoppers could send him to jail for the rest of his life. It wasn't a good feeling, but, you know, even though I was in shock and I didn't believe it, you know, I still knew, I still knew that I had to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't call, I would live with that for the rest of my life. And the friend Mike told calls police too. He did something to his parents. Did it, like, did he hurt them? Are they still alive? My understanding of it was that he, he killed them. Like the bodies are supposed to be at his house. I don't think it's a joke. The kids I spoke to who were at the party were shocked that they had been at a murder scene but they also thought it was pretty cool that they'd been at this famous party. There had been uh, a homicide. A 17-year-old young man had killed his parents with a hammer. What was your first thought? First thought is no. 17-year-olds don't kill their parents with hammers. When Detective Kristen Meyer arrives on the scene in the wee hours of the morning, remnants of the party are still apparent. We find beer bottles everywhere. They're all over the front yard. You come up. Here's the door. Officers. The officers knock on the door. Knock on the door. Lights go out. So one officer gets cover and starts calling for backup. And this officer here, the door opens. And there stands Tyler. When we come back, she grabbed her head and said, why, Tyler, why? It's the question everyone wants answered. Why did Tyler snap? Was it a threat, a final ultimatum from his parents that pushed Tyler too far? That's your motive for the murder. Stay with us. Tyler Hadley has delivered exactly what he promised, the teenage party to end all parties, free-flowing drugs and alcohol with no parents in sight. But when morning breaks and the partiers have all gone home, Tyler is left with the chaos of empty beer bottles and the knowledge of something far worse hidden in the home he shared with his parents. Once again, Ryan Smith. At dawn, when police arrive at Tyler Hadley's house, the party is over. Officers see Tyler alone inside, pacing back and forth. And they creep up to this window because they can peek in. What kind of state was he in at that point? They talked about the look on his face. One officer describes it as deranged. Officers ask where his parents are. He said they're out of town, they're in West Palm Beach. He's placed in handcuffs, and the officers go in and search. Inside the master bedroom, they find what looks more like a garbage pit than a place where Tyler's parents slept just 24 hours before. The room is packed with items from all over the house. Furniture, magazines, pictures, food. Mom's good housekeeping magazine, homework from her students, a family calendar. Underneath, investigators find the bodies of Blake and Mary Jo Hadley. It's the darkest turn possible for a Saturday that began with ordinary errands for the Hadleys a trip to the local farmer's market, a visit to a dress shop. They were back home early afternoon, his father taking a nap, his mother at the computer. Tyler told his best friend, Michael Mandel, that to psych himself up, he listened to the Lil Boozy song, Feel Lucky. Then he grabbed a hammer. He said he stood behind his mother for five minutes while she was on the computer trying to figure out whether or not he should hit her or not, and then at some point he hit her. Mary Jo's screams woke his father. He rushed to the doorway and was stunned by what he saw. And he couldn't even move. And Tyler said he ran up to his father, hit him, and his father asked him why he's doing this, and he said, why the f not? Tyler told him that he then dragged his parents' bodies to their bedroom, then spent hours cleaning up the blood, stripping the walls, leaving empty hooks where family photos once hung, adding them to the pile. At some point during all of this, Tyler makes that post on Facebook that the party is on. 
he uses his parents' ATM card to withdraw 400 in cash and buys beer for the party. At the party, he's having a great time. He's playing round after round after round of beer pong. He's laughing. He's joking. He's planning a party for the uh, for the next night. What occurred that day was a what can only be described as one of the most heinous, cold-blooded, and calculated murders I've seen in 23 years as a prosecutor. The prosecutor assigned to the case, Tom Bacadal, tries to make sense of the grisly murders. This is not your kid from the wrong side of the tracks. This is not your kid who was raised in an abusive, violent family. And these parents gave him everything. Investigators find evidence that points to premeditation. For months, Tyler repeatedly talked about killing his parents to his friends. His mom took his phone away and he said he was going to kill her. He said something about, oh, I'm just, I'm going to kill my parents. I just specifically remember him saying, I'm going to kill my parents. He just said it with a smile, so that's why no one took it too serious. But no one knew just how calculating their friend was. He hid his parents' cell phones before killing them. And with no landline, he knew they couldn't call for help. Less than a month before he was to face trial, Tyler pleaded no contest, leaving a controversial question, his punishment. He could be protected by a 2012 Supreme Court decision, which ruled that for juveniles, a mandatory sentence of life without parole is unconstitutional. But prosecutors argue that with a crime so heinous, Tyler should never see the light of day. He has sentenced the whole family to life. But Tyler's defense team argues that Tyler was mentally ill. The major depressive disorder. He had issues with anxiety and depression. He was suicidal. And low self-esteem. He was drinking heavily and abusing drugs. It was not one thing alone. It was the deadly combination of them all. But the counter to this would be a lot of people have disorders, take drugs. Some even take illegal drugs, his choice, yet they don't kill their parents. What I think is one of the most important uh, factors is the juvenile brain. The juvenile brain does not fully develop um, until the age of 25. Adolescents don't show the same abilities to control, regulate, and identify their emotions as adults. Expert Dr. Randy Otto says the lack of control can turn teen impulse into action. The frontal part of the brain is not functioning as fully as it would as an adult to kind of keep that in check. So you have the emotional upset without the part of the brain that is focused on deliberation, reflection, and planning, and consideration. But the prosecutor says Tyler, just 153 days shy of his 18th birthday, should be treated as an adult. The state's president. This is not a youthful act of indiscretion. As for the motive, could it really just be the party? The prosecutor poured through messages Tyler exchanged with his friends for clues. In them, Tyler complains about the outpatient rehab program he's in, writing, I seriously hate that for real. But ultimately, we think that what happened was that the parents had threatened to put him into a full-blown inpatient program to commit him. Institutionalized at a home for troubled teens. You're going to take away what I want to do and I don't like it. Right. That's your motive for the murder. The decision over Tyler's fate has ripped the family in two. Mary Jo's mother, Tyler's grandmother, hoping for parole. I just want Tyler not to spend the rest of his life in jail because I know, I know, I know he's a life worth saving. But for his father's family, like Mike and Cindy Hadley, forgiving their nephew is out of the question. I can never forget what he did. Maybe someday. I, I can't say never. I don't know. Do you think he understands what he's done to your family? I really don't know at this point. This is a cold-blooded murderer that we're talking about here. Yeah, he's my, he's my nephew, and I love him, all right? There's only one sentence. It's life in prison. You don't think there's any way he could rehabilitate himself and be a productive member of society? Would, would you want him living with you if, if he got out? Mike's concern now entirely for Tyler's brother Ryan. That's the person that we need to feel sorry for. He lost his entire family. You know, he lost three people, his mom and dad and his brother. Could you state your name, please? Ryan Blake Hadley. Do you love your brother still? I do love my brother. Do you hurt for your brother still? Yeah, I hurt for my brother. But that love for his baby brother 
has its bounds. Under what circumstances would you like to maintain this relationship with your brother? Um, what I want is for him to get the maximum penalty possible. Mr. Hadley? Finally, Tyler speaks publicly about the crime, but offers little insight. I'd like to direct this to my entire family. All of them. Everyone. All of them. And, uh, I, I know it's hard to understand, and, uh, you can't begin to explain, you know, what happened. I just want everyone to know that I am, I am truly sorry for the, the acts I committed. The judge was unmoved. It is hereby the judgment and sentence of the court. The defendant be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. No one wants to see a youth behind bars, but in this case, he murdered both of his parents. A colder heart I've never seen. If he were here today, if you could speak to him directly right now, what would you say to him? Well, of course I'd ask the question, why? I might ask him, you miss your mom and dad? Didn't they mean anything to you? Was it worth it? Are you happy now? I hope that party was worth it. As of 2015, Tyler Hadley is appealing his sentence. Coming up, a good kid grounded and sneaking out to party. But when he comes home drunk, the consequences are deadly. The alarm went off, and then I saw the light come on. Caleb then turned around and simply said, you just shot me. When we come back. It's not unusual. A teenager sneaks out at night thinking his parents won't notice. A party, drinking alcohol, and he'll be back in bed before the rest of the house wakes up. But in the story you're about to see, that teenager never made it home. As Deborah Roberts first reported in 2014, only two people will ever know for sure what happened that night. And one of them is dead. It was late Saturday night. 16-year-old Caleb Gordley had a secret plan to sneak out of his house to go to a party with some friends. A popular three-sport athlete at Parkview High School in Virginia, Caleb was also an aspiring rapper, seeing himself as the next Jay-Z. The days go fast, but the time moves slow. It's like I'm stuck in sand, but I can't ever let go. Hey. He was a self-proclaimed rapper going by the name of Prince George. Yo, Caleb, Prince George. I like the core was his music, was his lyrics. I have 85 songs that I've collected. Good kid, Sean. Great kid. He was very respectful, very polite. Partier? No. Like, he did not drink, and that's what makes that night even more peculiar, even more odd. We're here walking to school. And out of character for Caleb. He's not much of a drinker, but he just, I guess, wanted to try for that night. Yet the one time Caleb decided to let loose, he would wind up dead in a stranger's home. It all began with the typical teen punishment. He had been grounded because he went to the park on a Sunday afternoon after I told him to clean his room. I said, one week, you cannot go anywhere. You go to school, you go to practice, whatever, you're coming straight home. And he accepted. He doesn't talk back. He doesn't get up in my face. He said, all right, Dad. Yeah. By the end of the week, Caleb is itching to get out of the house. We really want to party, don't want to get nothing. Tweeting throughout the day, honestly, who's throwing a party tonight? I'm trying to have fun tonight, no lie. Caleb and sister Eden are living with their dad. Their parents, Sean and Janae, are divorced. Their firstborn was a natural ham. Caleb, here at six, busting a move to NSYNC's girlfriend. He just had that energy that really attracted a lot of people to him because he was so fun and good-hearted. He just loved laughing and joking. To give their kids a better life, the Gordleys left behind the tough, crime-ridden streets of Dayton, Ohio, for the tranquil suburbs of Sterling, Virginia, where Sean is a corporate IT manager. 
I was happy with the area. I was happy with the school. Um, the community seemed to be very um, active and social and kind of close-knit. After the split, Janae moved back to Ohio to go to school, but never missed a beat with her kids. How much did you monitor his social media accounts? A lot. And that was the one time I didn't in that particular day. I would have saw the signs if I would have just looked that day. About the parties and... He was looking for some place to go that night. So at the stroke of midnight, Caleb slips out of his two-story home. He would never return. Caleb's first mistake would happen just after arriving at a buddy's house a few blocks away. Some of the boys begin tossing back vodka shots. By 2 a.m., a woozy Caleb decides it's time to go home before his dad notices he's gone. Good friend Corey Carrico was with Caleb. I took him back to my house, and I, I was going to make him stay there, but he knew he had to get home. I knew that for sure because he kept bothering us about it. Staggering now, Caleb needs his sober friend to walk him the few blocks home to his quiet cul-de-sac, where many of the houses in the development look nearly identical. We crossed this fence because all the houses are similar. And then once we crossed, we came up to this window over here. We thought this yeah, was the window. Yeah, we thought this was the window, and I just opened it up. I've never come in the back way before. It looks different from the back. I don't. I, I always come from the front when I come pick him up in the morning. So I, I figured it was his house because he thought it was his house too. Did you just sort of like shove Caleb in? No, he went in himself. The alarm went off, and then I saw the light come on, and then I heard yelling, which I thought it was dad. So then I ran because I thought I was going to get in trouble. Turns out it's not Caleb's dad. In fact, it's not even Caleb's house. It's the neighbor's home two doors down. The startled homeowner grabs his 40 caliber pistol that he kept next to his bed, thinking a burglar has broken in at 2.30 in the morning. In the chilling moments that follow, gunshots. How many times was Caleb actually physically shot? Once. 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 Out of four shots, he was hit once. A developing story now out of the start. Loudoun County Sheriff's deputies responded to a burglary with shots fired on... The next morning, news of a shooting quickly spreads through the neighborhood. At Caleb's home, there's panic. His sister Eden realizes her brother isn't in his bed. My friend's mother called her and told her that someone two doors away from us had gotten shot. She said somebody was trying to break in. I told my dad, he was like... I woke up this morning, Caleb's not home. I don't know where he is. I ran over to the neighbor's house, knocked on the door, and um, didn't find any information. I ran back in the house, called 911. What's going through your mind at this moment? I know my son's dead. I know he's dead. Corey dropped Caleb off at my house at 2.30 in the morning, and there was a shooting in my neighborhood at 2.30, and I can't find my son. I knew it instantly. His 16-year-old son shot dead. I could barely talk. And I was so lost, and I, I couldn't fathom surviving this. I didn't know. I was like, well, there's no, no, there's no, there's no going beyond this. Eden and Sean break the unbearable news to Janae in Ohio. Overcome with grief, she heads to Virginia. I wept in the airport. I wept on a plane in front of strangers, and it didn't even matter. You lost your son. Mm -hmm. Did you understand at all what had happened? I did. I understood that, you know, he made a mistake. And then it cost him his life. Yeah, my handsome man. A life even Caleb realized was fragile. This is the new microphone. And trust me, I have like six songs that I'm going to be putting out today. And one of those songs he wrote just months before dying is oddly prophetic. One, two, three. Your life can be done like that. Called Reckless, with the sound of gunshots in the background, Caleb rapped. Your life can be done like that. His own life cut heartbreakingly short in what seemed a classic case of self-defense. Somebody breaking into your house, you don't know. This person is going up the stairs, going towards where the homeowner's family was. And I guess he fell uh, in fear for their lives. I mean, I put it on me at first. I just, I thought it was all my fault because I took him to the wrong house. But you realize it, I mean, it was a tragic mistake. Yeah. Both Sean and Janae believed it was an awful accident until they got the police report. 
What it revealed would change everything for Caleb's parents. Once I got the details, I was absolutely outraged. Was it self-defense or something else? Murder. Stay with us. Yeah. After a night of drinking, 16-year-old Caleb Gordley mistakenly entered the wrong house and was shot dead by his neighbor just two doors down. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Caleb's father, Sean, was on a mission. And that was to let the world know my son made a mistake. He was not there to harm anybody. He was not there to rob anybody. That's all I cared about, letting everybody know he went to the wrong house. You said right after this happened that you felt forgiving towards your neighbor. Correct. Do you still? No, not 1% forgiving. I'll tell him right here and right now, I apologize for my son entering your house. I will take that. Beyond that, there is no forgiveness. Once I got the details, I was absolutely outraged. It was a horrible, horrible set of circumstances for the family, horrible set of circumstances for the shooter. But five months after their neighbor, seen here and identified by others in the neighborhood, shot and killed their teenage son. My son is gone. And nothing will bring him back. Sean and Janae are no longer conciliatory. It sounded like a mistaken identity. Someone thinks there's a burglar in their home and they're trying to defend themselves. At no point during the homeowner's count of the events, did he ever describe Caleb in any way being aggressive, ill intent, he did not approach him. He did not come after him in a violent way. In fact, Corey Carrico says his friend Caleb was visibly impaired when he tried getting him home. Yeah, he was stumbling a lot. He kind of he fell down on the sidewalk a couple times. I mean, even though he had to be home, I probably should have just kept him at my house. Even, I mean, or waited a little bit longer. Sean is convinced that his son was confused since his home has a nearly identical floor plan to the neighbors. From the vantage point upstairs, Sean showed us what he thinks happened, according to the police report. He was crawling into his window. Correct. Where do you think the homeowner saw him first? According to the police report, the homeowner came down this hall, immediately saw Caleb in the kitchen area. He saw his face, he did not recognize him, and he yelled at him to get out of the house. He suspects his intoxicated son believed he was hearing his dad's angry voice. So Caleb would have continued on thinking he's going to his bedroom, you think? Yes, correct. But remember, the six-foot-tall boy is in his neighbor's home and headed toward the bedrooms where his neighbor's fiance and son are staying. The homeowner said he made eye contact with Caleb and it was a dazed look on his face. So he knew he was on drugs, alcohol, whatever the case may be. And as he came up the steps, he said he saw no weapon. His neighbor then yells out and fires a warning shot fearing the unknown intruder who's making his way upstairs near his family. Caleb then, according to a statement, turned around, didn't attack the person shooting at him, and simply said, according to the statement, you just shot me. Then the end for Caleb, an ending Sean finds unconscionable. The autopsy report revealing the cold hard fact that Caleb was shot in the back. The homeowner angled against the wall and fired through Caleb's chest, and then a fourth shot past Caleb's head that he aimed at his head, missed. Caleb then took two more steps and fell face down on the floor, right in front of what he thought was his own bedroom. I don't care if you're in the Wild West. I don't care if you're in the hood. There was no honor in shooting somebody in the back. So why would the homeowner fire multiple times when this person didn't appear to have a weapon? It's 2.30 in the morning. You have a person that, that actually comes in through a window. The alarm sounds off. I mean, he was six foot tall, unknowns to the, uh, to the homeowner, uh, wearing dark clothing. The homeowner advised him to stop, you know, and that, that he would shoot, and, and Caleb continued to come forward. He lined himself up at the perfect angle to shoot a hollow point bullet through my son's lung and explode his chest. And then a fourth shot at his head for good measure. That's what he did. Do you see it as murder or accidental shooting? Murder. Murder? Mm -hmm. He shot him in the back. If you're really in fear of danger, 
of your life and your family's life, why would you allow a person that you uh, that appeared to be dazed to you walk right past you and then you shoot him in the back? If Caleb would have crossed that street right there and got hit by a car, I would have nobody to blame but Caleb. I have somebody else to blame for my son's, de son's death. I just do. This kid is a kid of color, a black kid. Did that have any impact? on this case? I, I, I can't see that it would. The entire situation was just bad all the way around. Somebody coming into your coming into your house, uh, not stopping when you're giving them commands to stop. Somebody continued to advance on you. Somebody going up the stairs where your family is. The homeowner has not spoken out publicly. Have you had any sense of how this has impacted him? In conversations with my detectives, I understand that he was devastated, devastated by, by what had happened, uh, so much so that he had had to take a couple weeks off. After a police investigation, no charges were filed against the neighbor, a volunteer firefighter who owns a consulting company. Through his attorney, he declined our request for an interview, saying the incident was an unfortunate tragedy on every level. But as we are not confident that participating in your program would contribute to the healing process, we are unwilling to so participate. Ten months after their son's death, Sean and Janae Gordley still can't understand how a teenage mistake can end so tragically. The man who took their son's life did reach out to the Gordleys through his attorney, saying he was sad about what happened. But Sean threw out the note, offended by its formal tone. Do I hate him? No. Do I want him put away? No, I don't think that's going to solve anything. Do you want to hear from him personally? I would love to. He's two doors down. Two doors down. Do you still see this neighbor? I never saw him before. I haven't seen him since. What's the lesson in all of this, Janae? We need to get out of our own bubbles. We don't get outside and shake our neighbor's hands or invite them over to dinner or just get to know them better. Two doors down. Two doors down. And you didn't recognize that that was your neighbor. Some people would have packed up and moved right away, but yet you somehow managed to stay here. The first few months, there was no way I was leaving. I keep the door closed because it smells like him in here still after all these months. I smell him right now. On his blanket, on his pillow, we haven't washed anything. We haven't vacuumed. I come in here, sometimes I'd, I'll take a nap on his bed. And he awakens to a wall of emotional memories scrawled by Caleb's classmates who were shattered by their friend's sudden death. I don't know anybody who didn't like him for any reason. You just put a smile on your face. Absolutely great kid. This was his um, 16th birthday, so this is his last birthday. His son would be 17 now, a high school senior making college plans with his friend Corey. He's such a great friend. It's a shame if you never knew him. He was such a funny person. I truly believe that my son was a gift. Yeah, we got 16 and a half awesome years. I will hold on to that.